I appreciate everybody being patient for those couple minutes. Someone wasn't working with the live stream, which always happens when you're running just a couple minutes late. So that just figures, obviously. But I also appreciate the men that filled in last week. I know they're not all in this built room right now, but I appreciate Cody and Kyle for filling in last Wednesday. I know Cody did the uh, class. Kyle did the invitation. I also appreciate Curtis and Casey for filling in uh, last Sunday. I know they uh, uh, Curtis did the sermon or the class, and Casey did the sermon. I appreciate those guys filling in. I say that every time I leave, but it's always nice to just ask people and get an automatic yes. So I appreciate those guys. I didn't get to watch it because it wasn't live streamed, hence the issues this morning. Uh, but I do have all confidence that it went great, at least in most of them. So Casey's I heard was a little iffy, but I guess we'll figure that part out later. Um, Joshua chapter 1 is where we're going to begin this morning. Before we start, I'm going to ask John if he doesn't mind to lead us in a word of prayer. Amen. Thank you. Um, it's been a couple weeks since we've uh, talked about Joshua, so I'll start, kind of start off with the same question that we started off two weeks ago. What is the nation of Israel like by the time you get to the beginning of Joshua? That's how we kind of, more or less what we covered a couple weeks ago. But what is the nation of Israel like when you start Joshua? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. We, we tend to think of Israel pre-Joshua as being a nomadic group, and they certainly are. I mean, there's no argument that they're wandering. That's the very definition of those 40 years. That being said, they probably spent quite a bit of time in each one area. So they had certain practices, agricultural hunting. They have certainly had a military. That's why Joshua 1 kind of exists and why it's possible. So I do think that there's, there's a lot of things you could say, but a nomadic existence is probably the biggest part of it. Spiritually speaking, what are they like? Yeah. Yeah, everybody that complained died before that those forty year, or before those forty years was up. So that leaves Joshua and Caleb as the only people that are over, if my math is right, sixty at this age. So you've got that kind of demographic. It's very much a younger demographic. They weren't as familiar with the situation in Egypt. They don't have those temptations. That's another big thing. Spiritually, how else would you describe them? You could probably say a lot of things about them. It's interesting that you say that because when we're going to talk this morning about the extermination of the Canaanites, and this isn't just a comment for Nathan, but when we, when we talk about the extermination of the Canaanites, we tend to think of it in terms of genocide as a very like angry, hateful thing. But in a lot of ways, I think you can describe it as a cleansing of the land. I think that's the way that oftentimes the Bible talks about it. And in reality, when you look at the Israelites during those 40 years, they were also going through a cleansing as well. So I do think you can kind of bring both of those things into it. The text is very explicit when you talk about the nation of Israel, that there's three kind of things that they were known for. Number one, they're a holy people. Why are they a holy people? Yeah, Curtis. Right. Right. 
Yeah. Uh, they had a, a point they were saying is that they had a generation of teachers. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, and that and then what you said there at the end kind of goes on what Nathan was talking about, and what uh, also was said was that it's kind of a cleansing. So they, they don't have the ties that they had, or obviously in ex, in Egypt. So that's certainly there. But you also mentioned the kind of religious reform of them. This was a nation that previously during the slavery period and beforehand, they obviously don't have a law that we know about. At least there's nothing said about any kind of of law in that 400 year period. Patriarchal laws obviously in effect before that. So when you're looking at this nation that's now moving into Israel, moving into Canaan, now their transformation is into a spiritual people. They're not just a national identity. Now they have a spiritual identity. So I certainly think that's there as well. What does God mean, though, or Moses mean when he says in Deuteronomy 7 that they are a holy people? That's true. And I think we're going to see that, I think, next week when we talk about Rahab, when Rahab is very aware of the fact that they've kind of obliterated everybody else on their path to Canaan. That's something that... The reputation obviously precedes them. By the time they get to Canaan, by the time they get to Jericho, everyone's well aware of who the Israelites are. And especially that understanding, as you mentioned, that God is with them. So I certainly think that's in play as well. We've had three hands. Mom, go ahead. I think, yeah, I think that's exact. When we look at Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 10, that's the explicit mention in there is he says, I didn't choose you because you were more in number, because you were more handsome, because you were mightier. That's not why I chose you. I chose you because I made the promise to your forefathers. So that's exactly what he's talking about. Lee, did you have something to add? Yeah. Yeah, there is. And I think when we just got done talking about the Sermon on the Mount, when you look at, for instance, how Jesus talks about Matthew 5, you are a city set on a hill. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about the group, obviously, as a church, kingdom citizens. But he's also just talking about individuals. And that's something that they need to be cognizant of. That's the exact same way that Israel is. When Israel is almost destroyed by God, I think three times, it may just be twice, Moses intercedes and says, if you do this, then everybody's going to see what type of God you are. They don't want to see that. So I do think that's a part of it. Paul? Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a distinction to them that is different from everybody else. Yeah, and that's that's a big part of it too. It's not just a nation that's wandering into a nation and destroying everything. There's a purpose, there's a mission, there's a I hate to say a divinely ordained path, but that's about as divinely ordained as you could possibly get, I think, in Scripture. So it certainly is something that God had a hand in the whole way through. So you're right, exactly right in that regard. There's two other things that Moses mentions in this passage in Deuteronomy. It says that there are stubborn people and an arrogant people. Is Moses... Let me ask you a better question. Why can Moses say this about these people? I knew I'd get at least one chuckle. Why? What's that? He dealt with them for 40 years. And this isn't just something that Moses says in Deuteronomy 9 and Deuteronomy 8. It's something that he sprinkles repeatedly throughout his last sermon. He says that you're a stubborn people. He says that they're an arrogant people. That's not just Moses blowing off steam. Why is he telling them this? And also, why does God tell Moses that? I guess that's a 1B question. Right. Yeah. I mean, the cycle isn't unfamiliar. You see it in, you see it in Exodus. You see it in Numbers. You're going to see it again in Judges. You're going to see it a little bit here in Joshua. But what's interesting about it, too, is Moses says you're a stubborn, you're an arrogant people. These are people that have re- turned away from God. It seems like at every chance they got. Joshua is going to say almost the exact same thing at the end of Joshua. He says, choose ye for this day whom you will serve. As for me, my house, we will serve the Lord. That's that whole statement. Right before that, though, he says, uh, or I'm sorry, right after that, the people respond, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, no, you're not. Why is Joshua able to say that to them? And he uses the whole thing as a witness against them. Why does Joshua say you're not going to serve God? What has Joshua also figured out as if he didn't know it already? Curtis? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So 
Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, Joshua is familiar with it. I mean, he obviously sees it from a national perspective. He saw what Moses saw, all those other places. He also saw it, as you mentioned, within the situation with the 12 spies. My math is terrible, but mentally, I think that's about 83% of those people were wrong. Joshua and Caleb were the only two people that were right. Don't correct me on my math. This is not the time nor the place for that. But I, I, Joshua saw it from multiple avenues. And so he's saying the same thing Moses said, he's saying the same thing the judges are going to say. You people are stubborn. You people are arrogant. But the thing to keep in mind is this is not something specific to those people. This is something that all of us can fall victim to, so I think that's the lesson for all of us. Let's end that question and jump into arguably the biggest controversy within the entire book of Joshua. We mentioned this at the end of last week, or two weeks ago, we were going to be thinking about it. The biggest question, the biggest issue with Joshua is that he is told to exterminate everybody. Why does God require the extermination of every last Canaanite before they take the land? This is seen as genocide. It's one of the main arguments atheists will make about how God is a hateful, vengeful God. Why does God require that? Right. So I'm going to pull on my atheist hat. I have it right here in my back pocket. I got it on vacation. I put it on. And if I'm an atheist, my reply back to that is, it's not the Canaanites' fault that the Israelites fell. That was their problem. Why should the Canaanites have to suffer for that? You don't have to answer that. I'm just saying that would be a response of 12,000 probably. And you're right about it for what it's worth. Lee, go ahead. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah. It doesn't take much for Israel to fall. I don't think that's a question. I mean, the Israelites don't need any help turning against God. You saw a little bit of idolatry based on Mount Sinai. The golden calf incident is a big part of that. But you're right. I mean, no intermarry, don't intermingle, don't have any relations with them. They obviously do. You see what happens. So that's the argument from a spiritual perspective. Curtis, go ahead. Right. It is interesting that you say that, and that's, I mean, that, that is an argument once again, and I think that we, we can say that. That's one of two reasons, at least in my opinion, that we can look at it from this perspective. Number one, at this to kind of paraphrase what you talk about, it's a sense of divine justice. The very first time that the Amorites appear inside the biblical narrative is in Genesis 15, verse 12. It mentions that the Amor iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I don't know what that means. Most people probably don't know what that means. It has something to do with idolatry. It has something to do with their practices, all those different things. By the time you get to Numbers chapter 21, verse 21 through 30, now God has said, go into, the, go into Canaan. The, Can or the Israelites try to go past. The Canaanites do not let them. There's that whole little animosity there. So in some sense, it is seen as a vehicle for divine justice. I think that's a very strong argument. Once again, it's a spiritual argument, though. What else could you say? You're right about that, too. The land is God's to give. It's his possession. If he wants to remove these people and put the other people into it, that's certainly his right. And I think that's a big argument to make here, because sometimes we look at this extermination, we say, well, this is, I don't, I don't mean to use a buzzword from today's world, but this is racism. That's obviously what's happening here. How do you know this isn't racism, what's happening? Or nationalism or tribalism or whatever you want to use. A bunch of isms. Yeah, Ken, go ahead. Yeah. Right. You're right about that. I mean, and that goes to the second thing that's been mentioned a couple of times about the influence. And certainly, I mean, if you, they intermarry, there's going to be some there's going to be some influences that will creep over. I've seen people make this argument when they correlate it with First Corinthians chapter six, when they say, don't be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. 
They'll try to argue the same thing that a Christian shouldn't marry a non-Christian. I think that is not at all what's in view here in this section. I think that's a bogus argument. But you'll see how people will say, well, the influence is strong and you need to kind of keep it, you need to keep yourself pure. And I do think that's a lot of what he's talking about. Paul, go ahead. Right. Yeah, I'm going to actually move the microphone over so you can say God's not racist into the microphone. But, yeah, I I mean, it can't be, as you mentioned, it's not person to person. It's not even God towards person. I mean, that's not what's in view here because it's not about race. Levi? Am I allowed to make a biblical argument about this? No. Lee, go ahead. I'm just kidding. Yeah. (laughs) Very nice pun, yeah. Right? So um, you get the, this you know, story of the end of uh, the flood has ended and they found dry land and now Noah has become a farmer, plants a vineyard. And there's a whole, this whole story about how he takes, you know, overtake, overtakes, you know, the wrong word. Mm, anyway, he makes wine from his grapes and he becomes drunk. Uh huh. Yeah. But here's a prophet of God cursing mm-hmm. the father of Cain. Yeah, and uh, the prophecy, I think, there in Genesis 9 talks about how their brothers shall serve your brothers. And I agree with that. And I do think that there's, I, I don't think it's too far reaching to say that. I do think there's an application of what we're talking about with the Canaanites. At the same time, that's where it needs to stop because when you take it further, and this is just for reference sake, that's an argument that slaveholders used a couple hundred years ago to talk about why they can enslave people from Africa. So you're right, as long as that's where the prophecy stops, I think that's perfectly applicable and I have no problem with that. But that's not really talking so much about how they're going to be, well, let me back up a little bit. That's not because of this. It's not as if the people were doomed because of this. As much as it is, it's still their issue. I mean, Genesis 15, the Amorites, the Canaanites, these were wicked, wicked people that you can go into detail with. So it's because of their sins that they were obliterated. And that's why I think this conversation is important. Will you go ahead? Fast forward to the New Testament. Sorry, I didn't catch you off. Fast forward to the New Testament, then uh, we, get, we get the, the statement, evil, have, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good war. Right. Right. And do all these things against the true against the true God. Mm-hmm. You don't want that hanging around. Yeah, you certainly don't want it hanging around, and their failure to take the rest of the land is a is I think it's not only just disobedience, it shows how willing they were to compromise. And I'm not saying that compromise is always a bad thing, but I do think in terms of your spirituality, I think compromise doesn't really have any place in it. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't even follow the command. You're right. Lee, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the influences, all those, and these are all good arguments. And I'm, I'm, for, I'm not saying for one second that any of these are incorrect. I think from an atheist perspective, they don't oftentimes hold water. And I, I think that there's some things that we can say on top of this that I think also are well, too. For one, if we look at the aspect of divine justice, that's how you know, to answer the question we asked a couple minutes ago, that's how you know this isn't racism. The people were destroyed in Genesis 15, Numbers 21, because they're evil. What would happen to the Israelites if they were evil? The exact same thing, exactly. So it's not as if God has this special people, which he obviously does, but it's not as if he has this special people that are bulletproof, that they're impenetrable, that there's nothing to be done for them. The idea of a replacement is you bring these people in, you give them the opportunity, but if God just overlooked everything, then he wouldn't be just. Which brings me to the second question, which is that this is an example of God's divine justice. 
There's a lot of things I think when we look at the Old Testament, specifically the early part of the Old Testament, the historical narratives, they don't really seem to fit with us because our idea of justice can be sometimes skewed. For instance, when you back up into Num or Deuteronomy chapter 24, Moses is not allowed to enter Canaan. Why is he not allowed to enter Canaan? Lack of faith and disobedience. That seems especially harsh considering what Moses had done. That's us looking 2,000 years into the past into that scenario. But God's justice is different than ours. And so instead of us saying, well, God's unjust and bringing him down to our level, maybe we need to elevate our own understanding, our own sense of justice. And I think that's one of the things that we can pull away from this, this situation as well. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Yeah, he does that. I think he does it twice, maybe even three times. But the one that probably is the most familiar is the one on Mount Sinai when God's just seething with wrath and Moses intercedes. And then he comes down and he destroys the tablets and makes them drink gold, which is a whole other story. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it. it They will eventually not become any better. At this stage, they should be better, but you're right. They're eventually going to devolve into this type of thing as well. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments on this? We can talk about this throughout this quarter. Obviously, this question will come back up. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 34, starting verse 9. This should be a page before where you're already at in Joshua 1. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. Moses is now dead. Moses, or it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. The sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Since that time, verse 10, no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. For all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants, all his land, for all the mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. There's a pretty strong argument to be made that these last several verses, obviously Moses can't write them because he's dead. These are penned by Joshua. This all happens at the top of Mount Nebo. This is... As best we can tell, Moses' viewpoint into Canaan. So this is the last thing that he sees before he eventually dies. Joshua now takes the charge. What is, going, what is the kind of pressure that's on Joshua's shoulders as he's leading these people into Canaan? So I think sometimes we make this transition. We don't oftentimes think about the pressure that Joshua was under. How stressful is it for him at this moment, now that Mo Moses is gone? I almost said Mashua. That's not the same person. Yeah. Yeah, the, the fact that whatever, or the fact that Moses just died because of that one sin, quote unquote, because of that sin, that seems possibly extreme to him. So maybe in that situation, he is thinking, I better not mess up. I better stay on the straight and narrow. So you're right, from a religious perspective, he better stay with where God wants him to be or else things could happen. What else is on Joshua's mind? Go ahead. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. I mean, it's worth mentioning. We'll mention it, obviously, throughout this, throughout this quarter. But it's worth mentioning, too, Joshua does not have all the roles that Moses does. If you remember in Leviticus, the institution of the Aaronic priesthood. That's the line now through Aaron. Moses is still of that lineage. So Moses is still operating in a lot of ways as a priest, even though he's not technically a priest. He still offers that spiritual guidance. The priesthood is in, fe is in, in view by large for a long time before Joshua takes charge. Joshua doesn't have the spiritual oversight as much as Moses did. Obviously, he's still the leader, so that's still there. But his focus primarily is just militarily. It's just leadership. It's trying to get these people into Canaan. So you're right. There is a little bit of a difference, but that at least is taken off of his shoulders. Yeah. So just thinking in human terms, how much did Joshua expect Moses to be the one leading them into Canaan? That is a great question. Yeah. Yeah, nobody was probably more disappointed that Moses hit the rock than Joshua was because now it's his job to lead these people. He thought he'd just skate right in. I mean, trying to 
Yeah. Even though Moses was 120, and so he probably deserved to just rest at some point. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a noticeable change, and there's a couple of things that I think are noticeable about this transition. First and foremost, Moses never really leaves the narrative. You see right there in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2 where God just straight up tells Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. That's an important phrase because that phrase, Moses, my servant, is used, I think, upwards of 18 times in the book of Joshua. It is almost always used in reference to Moses. The only time it's ever referenced about Joshua is in Joshua 24 and verse 2. So the, I don't want to say the ghost, but the reputation of Moses hangs over the entire narrative in the book of Joshua. It always references Moses, always talks about him as being a servant. And there's not a lot of people that are referenced as being a servant of the Lord nearly in the same vein that Moses is. And so that's, I think, an important thing to keep in mind. When you look also at the rest of this chapter, and we'll obviously read this section here in just a second, but when you look at verse 3, he says, I've given it to you, talking about the authority, the oversight. I've given it to you just as I've given it to Moses. He also says, just as I've been with Moses, so I will be with you. So there's that whole scene as well. And then he also says in verse 7, do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Why does Moses hang over this story so strongly? And part of it may be because, as Jeff talked about, he was the one that was supposed to go. I think really he was the one that had led them for yeah. a long time. He is, That's the name they knew before him. Right. He's the deliverer, but he's not the finisher. And I think, obviously, you can make the parallels with the New Testament with that all you want. I mean, it's parallel to, you know, replacing a legend with the apocalypse. You don't want to be the one following the legend. You want to be the one, the person following the person that follows the legend. That's true. Keep, <laughs> let's keep the Cowboys comments to a minimum. Right. Yeah. But it's like, you know, but Joshua did have an advantage. God said, I'm with you. Right. There was no issue for Joshua there. Right. And that's the, that's the thing that I think we really need to key in on is, is the, is the legacy of Moses there? Yeah. But the point that God is making here in this passage is just as you saw me be with Moses and Moses was successful because of me, I will also be with you and you will be successful as a result of that too. So that's the continuation there. And I think if Joshua, I mean, obviously he talked quite a bit to Moses. If he knew about Moses's early life, which we'll talk about this on Wednesday, he wasn't the best candidate for leadership either. What is Moses' early years like? Whenever God tells him, hey, I need you to go and deliver my people, what does Moses do? Well, he, he argues for two straight chapters about why he's not the right fit for it. And so I don't know if Joshua had any hesitancy regarding this, but obviously he's, obviously he's you know, any hesitancy he does has needs to be kind of put to rest. So I think that's really the connective tissue that's going on here. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments? Yeah, John. Right. That's true too. Yeah. 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 I mean, the very first reference we have of Joshua in the entire Old Testament is when he's, I think, when he's leading them against the Amalekites. That's the scene where Moses' arms are outstretched and they have to support him. That's the first time we see about Joshua. So you're right. That's where, that's where he kind of comes in. That's his whole role. But these, and we won't talk about it probably too much individually throughout the course of this quarter, but it's something to keep in mind. For instance, in Joshua, the third chapter, we don't have time to read it right now. When they cross over Jordan into Canaan, officially, what happens to the Jordan River? Does anybody remember? It parts, and they walk across on dry land, which makes you think of what? It takes some things you, makes you think of Moses and parting the Red Sea. So these analogies, these metaphors, these images are all over the book of Joshua in terms of its comparison to Moses. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Okay, Joshua chapter 1 basically centers around three unique conversations. There's not, it's not an especially long chapter, but it is obviously worth diving into. Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 1, this is God talking to Joshua. This makes up the bulk of what we just mentioned there. It says, now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, there's that phrase again, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, rise across this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them, to the sons of Israel, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea towards the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able, verse 5, to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will also be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. 
Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and be very courageous. Uh, Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have great success. Have I not commanded you, verse 9, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What is God telling Joshua in these nine verses? Right. He's, I, I like how you said that. I, my mind thought of those old jams from the 90s when you said he's trying to pump them up. But you're right. In a way, God is trying to pump them up. I hope nobody recalled when I said old jams from the 90s. I realize how that may, that may be shocking. But you're right. He is trying to pump them up. But he's not trying to do that just by saying, you got this. You know, I believe you. That's not what he's saying. What is he saying? You know, he says the same thing I promised Moses. Right. You get to. Exactly. There's no, okay, you're going to get this except. No, right. Exactly. There's that continuation that you're talking about. Just as I was with Moses, I will also be with you. It's noticeable, by the way, that there's no leader after Joshua. I think that's always fascinating. The elders and the people that knew him at that point, they obviously are there. But there's no continuation because the land is taken. So you're right. Just as I've been with Moses, I will also be with you. That's really the only one-to-one parallel you find with Moses in the Old Testament. Lee, go ahead. Right. Christ is our leader. Christ is our Passover. There is the Christ allusions to Moses. You're right. There's that connection, obviously. Yeah, I've seen it before in Moses's life. And so since I saw what God did with Moses, I know that God's going to be with me, too. There's the example for sure. What else is God telling Moses or God telling Joshua? Sorry. Yeah, Leah. Right. We're going to put a pin in that phrase because that phrase is really important to understanding Joshua one. So you're right. What he says is be strong and courageous. And we think, as Paul mentioned, we think this is just kind of him pumping it up. I think there's a lot more to that phrase than just you know, don't lose heart, those kinds of things, because I think there's a lot in that. But you're right. It's all part of pushing him forward. What else does he tell him? Curtis? That's right. There's a couple of things. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, I was about to just take straight off. You're right. There's a couple of things that I think are worth noticing. Number one is he says, don't let this law leave your, leave your mouth. So that's the big part of it. You need to focus, you need to follow along that side. But he also mentions there in Joshua chapter 1 and verse, um, I can't remember exactly where it is. Yeah, in verse 7, he says, do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. So there's the law that needs to be in your heart. But who is God talking to when he says you will have success wherever you go? This is going to sound redundant, but just roll with me on it. Right. He is talking about it to Joshua. As you mentioned, he's kind of alluding to the whole a nation of Israel. And I agree with that. I think, obviously, Israel needs to follow the law so that they have success. On a personal level, how does this apply to Joshua? Go ahead, Ken. How dare you, but go ahead. Right. Nothing wrong with that translation at all. That's probably the only time I'll ever say that in my life, but you're right. There's nothing wrong with that translation so that you'll act wisely, so you'll have success. But notice in both of those, there's a conditional aspect to that. And I think that's what's really important. We, we tend to think, as Paul mentioned, this is just God pumping Joshua up. It's him telling him that he's doing good. But there's that conditional aspect. If you look again in verse 7, be strong and be very courageous. Be careful to do according to all. So there's that conditional aspect of it. Do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commands you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. The conditional aspect of this is what? If Joshua doesn't hold the law, what's going to happen to him? He's not going to have success. Exactly. And that's not only applied on a personal level, but it's obviously also on a national level. So I think that's a part of this as well. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Right. We did all pages to help us get, get a burning page. We didn't talk a lot of burning. The nation is usually in decline. Right. Yeah, I, I really didn't think I'd hear the phrase frowny face king or smiley king this morning, but it's always a good day when somebody mentions it. And you're, but you're exactly right. When you fast forward to Kings and Chronicles, the success of the nation directly rested upon the leadership of the king. And whether or not he, as he mentions here, kept, keeps the law inside of his heart, keeps it inside of his mouth. So I think you're right. I think you do see a foreshadowing of what you're going to see with kingship later in regards to Joshua. Joshua isn't a king. First king is not Saul, ironically. It's actually, I can't remember who it is. It's somebody in Judges. But... You're right. Whatever the leadership does, obviously the nation does too. That's a great point. And bonus points for using frowny face king. Debbie? Right. It is. Yeah, I mean, if you, you're exactly right. I mean, their success is dependent on their obedience to God. And you can look back, you know, the first instance where you see Joshua's arms are up in the, up in the air. Some people have looked at that as saying, well, he's giving, Moses is giving glory to God. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. But regardless, the point is the same, that their obedience will dictate their success. And I think it's also worth noticing, too, as you mentioned, that if you think about this commandment here in Joshua chapter 1, to keep the law in your heart, keep it in your mouth, keep it in your mind, by the time you get to Judges, what is the phrase that is used a few times to describe their downfall? There was no king in Israel, and every man did what? Every man did what was right in their own sight. So you see kind of a bookend with Judges from what you see here in Joshua 1. Keep the law in your heart. By the time you see their downfall in Judges, everybody's just kind of doing whatever they want to. And that's the reason for their downfall. Right. Yeah. It's a significant, we'll talk about this next week when we get, or maybe in a couple weeks when we get more into Jericho proper. Next week is more about Rahab. But when you look in Jericho proper, there's a huge shift from, from Jericho, which is a monumental city that is almost impenetrable. It's so technologically advanced. And then it's counterweighted by the failure at AI, where you have this massive Jericho that falls by the command of God. AI, somebody just kind of goes off on their own, and you saw what happens. It's an embarrassing loss. And so it's an interesting, to quote, use Paul's word, it's an interesting juxtaposition when you see how the two counterweight each other. But you're right. That's, that's what you'll see depicted time and time again. Look in verse 10 now. This is Joshua now turning to the people, or rather the officers of the people. He says to them in verse 11, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you are to cross this Jordan. Go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it. Notice he doesn't give them an option. He saw what happened last time they sent out spies. They're going to send spies in Jericho. But that's a different spy setup, if you will. Verse 12, To the Reubenites and to the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God gives you rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, all your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. That's covered in Deuteronomy. But you shall cross before your brothers in battle array, all your valiant warriors, and shall help them until the Lord gives your brothers rest as he gives you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan towards the sunrise. Who does Joshua talk to primarily in this section? He talks to the entire nation, get ready to go into battle. Right. Yeah, there's two and a half, there's two and a half tribes, Gad, Reuben, half tribe Manasseh, that are going to stay on the east side of the Jordan. Their families are going to stay there. They're going to go battle. Which, by the way, keep in mind, this is a seven-year war. This isn't something that's going to end soon. So you go over there and fight. This is, this is saying, I think, a lot of times as a nondescript moment where it seems like, well, they just need to go fight and this isn't that big of a deal. This very issue was a controversy in Deuteronomy. It's going to be a huge controversy later in Joshua. Does anybody know what happens? Later in Joshua, after the whole battles won, Canaan's conquered. Obviously, there's parts that weren't. They go back and they erect an altar towards God. And the, the two and a half tribes, they erect an altar to God. The other oh, nine and a half, my math is terrible, nine and a half tribes look at that and say, well, this is idolatry at its finest. They almost go to civil war over that. 
And so I think what you're seeing in this passage, number one, is, as you mentioned here, is you see this, this emphasis on unity. You're going to fight for something that essentially isn't yours. But you also see a strong spiritual leaning, at least during the time period of Joshua's life. And that kind of all revolves around this two and a half tribe of Manasseh issue. Um, anybody have any thoughts or comments on that? Okay, look at verse 16 now. This is now the people responding back to Joshua. They answered Joshua saying, all that you have committed, commanded as all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go just as we obeyed Moses in all things. So we will obey you only may the Lord, your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not uh, obey your words and all that you do o- does not obey your words and all that you command them shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. What do the people tell Joshua in this passage? Right. Notice, first and foremost, there's no real mention of Moses as kind of, we wish he was in charge, we don't like you. So there's not that. But furthermore, as you mentioned, we'll treat you like we treated Moses. Just as we followed him, we'll follow you. So there's that reassurance. What else do they tell him in this passage? Yeah, anybody wants to desert, nobody puts their hand to the plow, nobody's with us, we're going to kill them. So we've, we've got your back, you can depend on us. There's the raw, raw mentality once again. I mean that in a good way. I don't mean that in certainly a denigrating way. What else do you see in this passage? They did. Yeah. Yeah, the story of Achan, when we talk about God's justice, that's another moment. And I'm sure there's going to be several moments where we talk about this. But you're right. When Achan fell, when Achan hid, they turned on him. There's no issue there. And I think you see that a couple more places, too. So you're right about that. What do they say to him, though, in verse 19 or in verse 18? Be strong and of good courage. This is what Leah mentioned earlier. We're now removing that pin. This phrase that is for some reason an aerial font, I don't understand that. But it is used a lot of times in Scripture. What does it mean to be strong and of good courage? Paul actually appropriates this in the Greek in the New Testament when he says, quit ye like men. There's the King James Version for our KGV people. Go ahead. It is. I mean, it's obvious. it is about leaning on faith, leaning on God. I think that's a part of it. What does it mean to be strong and of good courage? If you're Joshua about to embark on this for seven years, why is that phrase important? Trust in God. Lean on him. Lean on his word. I think that's a part of it, too. Yeah. Yeah, you never lose faith. You never lose courage. And I, I, all of those are correct. In my personal opinion, what I think the emphasis, go ahead, before I give away the big ending. I think it has a lot to do with remembering what God has done. It does, yeah. It, it talks about focusing on what he says and what he's done for you and using that as a catalyst for the future. I totally agree with that. In my opinion, I think the emphasis in a phrase like this is on perseverance, is on longevity. If you think about the amount of time they're going to go through all these different places, it ends up being something where at some points in times, maybe they forget about God. Maybe they forget what he's done. But to be strong and of good courage is to be strong in God and have courage based on that. This is exactly what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 when he uses the armor of God, when he talks about how when you've done everything in that day to stand. After you've equipped the armor, what do you need to do? What's the only thing left to do? Be strong, to persevere. And so this phrase becomes more or less a rallying cry. If you look at all the different places that it's used, and I'll leave this chart up for a minute because I think it's fascinating. When you look at how this phrase is used by these different parties to other parties, some of them are obvious. You see, for instance, God saying this to Joshua, not only in Joshua 1, three times, but also in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 23. You see Israel mentioning it towards Joshua, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 18. But you also see Moses using this towards Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 6. And then Moses eventually says it to Joshua. Notice nobody's saying it to God because nobody needs to tell God that. But Moses says it also to Joshua in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 7. So when you think about phrases that are rallying cries in Scripture, be strong and of good courage isn't just something they throw on in the back end of all these different things. This is the very way in which they're going to take this place. They're going to root themselves in God, and they're going to have courage no matter the circumstance moving forward. This is essentially what it's all about. I'm not going to put this up here because I promised this next week 
we are going to talk about, we're not going to bring it up the beginning of class, but next week we're going to talk about Rahab and her lies. So come prepared. Think about that this week. The whole issue of Rahab, does she write to lie? Was she not write to lie? That's what I want to talk about next week. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments? Okay. If not, we'll pick up with Rahab next week. Thank you, guys.